um, having a better idea of seasonality of birds, all the kind of data that I can get so much more quickly and easily with these technologies. So uh, let's march on. Here's our agenda for the evening. Uh, we'll start with an overview of uh, the technology for birders. You know, we'll, we'll try and level set. We'll try and talk a little bit about history. Um, we'll talk about some of the current popular tools just so we get some idea of, you know, how we categorize them. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the evolution of birding technology. Um, and we'll have this focus, continued focus throughout our presentation on all this wonderful data that we're gathering and these processes that we have that really can benefit already are starting to benefit, but will continue to benefit conservation efforts. And then we'll talk about equipment basics. You know, what are the uh, basic equipment that we use as birders? And I'll, for the purposes of this presentation at least, I'll differentiate between this equipment and the technologies. You certainly could, you know, in another presentation, you might group them all together, but for the purposes of this presentation, we'll separate them. Then we'll kind of dive into the meat of the presentation, uh, where we'll take a look at some of these tools, um, just at sort of at a high level. Uh, but we'll maybe jump on some websites so you can see some of these tools and get a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, and, and I've broken it out uh, into a, a handful of categories. Uh, and, and as we have discussed this, and as I've thought about it, we use the technologies for certain things. So. Um, initially, we, we can use it to find the birds, we can use it to help us identify birds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the um, online field guides, and I think that's a really interesting topic because we're so familiar with the field guide books. Um, it's really um, nice to see how those have transitioned uh, into electronic form and the benefits that we can gain from using them. Um, but just like the argument that my wife and I have all the time about books and Kindle at home, you know what, I like to use both. There are times when there's nothing like having a book in my hand. There's a tactile sense that I get and you know, maybe it's um, uh, something that, that I've just enjoyed since I was a young birder, but I really enjoy having a book. But I also love to have uh, the availability of an online uh, field guide. Um, we'll talk about documenting birds, uh, we'll talk about sharing observations. Uh, you know, sharing observations, that's an interesting topic we'll, we'll discuss a little bit more. I mean, um, some of us um, probably would kind of poo-poo the idea of, you know, bragging or sharing, or, but um, our uh, community of birders, particularly locally, um, does a great job of sharing birds so that others who may not um, be aware of where these birds are, can go out and find and see some of these birds. And so I, I think it's a, a really great opportunity um, for uh, particularly newer birders who would love to see their first owl or who would love to see some of these um, birds that migrate through but are not here in our winter time and maybe migrate right through and don't even nest here. So they have that smaller windows but if folks can learn where these birds might be during the migration, they're able to get out. So there's a real benefit to sharing. We'll talk about how the technology can benefit that process. And then we'll talk about improving your skills with an eye on helping conservation efforts. And um, some of that will be very straightforward, the, the benefit of gathering this data. And, and Tim will give us some insights into the kinds of things that we can do um, more of um, the kinds of things that we're not doing yet, but we can start, and how that information is used now, and perhaps how it can be used going forward. At, at the end, we'll, we'll talk about what are some of the implications, these technology implications for us as birders, um, and I, I think we need to look at some pros and cons there. And then the future of birding technology, some that we know, it's on the horizon, it's happening now, just sort of at a starting point, or a little further, and some that we are just making guesses at, because, you know, it's, it's a sort of rapidly evolving. 
Okay, so why do we even talk about tech for burgers? And I, I think we've sort of intimated that already. Um, the first two is I met are uh, what I imagine you're here to do tonight, which is to learn and perhaps even improve your understanding and your skills in using some of these tools. So, um, you know, our, our idea here is that we can teach, we can share this information so that you can learn and that you can improve um, with the idea of enhancing the experience. Um, whether you call that joy, whether you call that satisfaction, um, you know, we want to improve that experience for you. And then, of course, we want to, you know, we think there's a lot of uh, help that we can uh, share, that we can um, guide and provide um, through citizen science and conservation efforts. So the history of burning technology, again, remember this is just an overview. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, kind of the, the historical transition, which I call guns, glass, and gizmos, that, that takes us from, uh, say, uh, 500 years ago to, to present. Um, <laughs> uh, We'll talk about some of the common current technologies. Uh, we'll talk about the evolution of some of these tools. And we'll talk about uh, kind of high level when, we, when we're discussing technology being something that we use for conservation, what do we actually mean about that? OK, for example, we know that burning observations have been made throughout written history, right? We, we, you know, most of us are aware that um, birds are referenced in the Bible, they're referenced in uh, Native American culture. Around the world, uh, historically, cultures have referenced birds, so there's been an awareness since the, his, you know, the beginning of history of, of uh, a, a, a man that could uh, document these things. And uh, some of uh, the earliest observations that began to um, show more than just a passing interest in birds really happened, started around five to four to five hundred years ago. Um, and, and a lot of our focus, by the way, will be in North America. So I'm really referencing here, you know, 500 years ago, we had, you know, some of the earliest settlers in North America that um, that were starting to write and take notice of birds a little more and want to share that information. So there's authors uh, like White, Catesby, Bartram, um, folks whose names um, are attached historically to initial writings and drawings are artists. These were folks that were amateur artists, amateur ornithologists, um, just starting to um, put into publishing information about the birds in North America at that time, really just southeast and eastern birds. All these authors, these three authors, focus primarily in the southeast part of what is now the United States. So, so that's sort of pre-19th century. And then as we get into the 1800s, we get into the age of what is uh, often called, known as the shotgun ornithology era. Um, where birds were uh, euphemistically collected, taken, um, but with the intent often, usually, of adding to our knowledge and understanding of those birds um, and perhaps sharing those with true collections, collections at museums so that others could see these birds. And so, uh, folks like White and Catesby, they were, they were Brits. They were folks that came over from England and they were sending many of their specimens back to England um, for those collections. Um, and, and then we see this group of early ornithologists, folks that we know perhaps as birders, um, Alexander Wilson, J.J. Audubon, um, Baird, Ben Dyer, Zantus, Coos, these guys all were in the you know early 18 early to late 1800s overlapping one another um, in some ways very competitive gathering specimens and sharing those with museums um, and um, you may recognize them because there are birds named after several of these folks it wasn't until really the late 1800s 
when there started to be some pushback about using guns to collect birds and trying to observe birds without harming or killing them. And so we have one of the first field guides, which was uh, Florence Marion Bailey's Birds Through an Opera Glass in 1889. So this predates uh, Roger Tory Peterson by 40, 50 years, right? So she sees an opportunity to, you know, observe birds, and those opera glasses probably had a magnification of two to three times. But it was still a better way in her mind, and many others at the time, to observe birds without harming them. Then in the 20th century, we have um, the advent, really, of binoculars and telescopes um, for bird watching, scopes, spotting scopes as we call them, and then the earliest cameras um, taking photos of, of birds. They become more and more prevalent uh, in, the, uh, in the 1900s, and then finally we get to the 21st century, and we now have these amazing computers in our hand when we walk out of our house in the morning, we have them with us all day long with all this power, all this capability. And, uh, and if we're not using the phones on our smartphones, many birders have just terrifically um, um, powerful cameras uh, that seemingly provide us with uh, the ability to take magnificent photographs, uh, even as amateurs. So the evolution of these tools, you know, I really love this idea of the evolution of field guides. Um, if we, if we, we use Bailey as a starting point, and there were, there were some other field guides before that, but, but Bailey had this idea of looking at birds and, and setting up a, you know, drawings of birds um, that were images of kind of real live birds without having taken them or collected them. And then, although there was a there was a British field birding field guide uh, that came out just a few years before Peterson, Roger Torrey Peterson in the 30s, his field guide really moved advanced things quite a bit because what he did was he said, looked at the bird and said there are distinctive field marks for these birds that if if a, if the you know lay birder is trying to compare a couple of these birds. These are the key field marks. Maybe it's a, a, a mark on the wing. Maybe it's the shape of the bill. Maybe it's a, 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 a bobbing of the tail. But these field marks will help the birder distinguish between two or five species. So he was the first to do that, and that was revolutionary. Uh, and then, of course, there have been just dozens and dozens of field guides since then. Uh, I think many of us felt that Sibley's field guide uh, 12, 15 years ago sort of advanced um, the field guides, but uh, boy, as I said before, each of us probably has our preferences, if it's Stokes, if it's Kaufman, if it's um, National Geographic, there are just so many great field guides out there and available to us. So we've seen those field guides advance over time. Um, you know, bird song recordings, um, I admit that I sort of have taken them for granted. I, I think since I became a birder, I, you know, bought those CDs or the cassette tapes first, and now I, you know, I use my smartphone to listen to, to birds' songs and calls to try and help myself memorize those to improve my ability to identify those birds in the field. But the recordings really, um, started becoming available in the late 30s, or mid 30s, late 30s, 40s, um, and the, while it wasn't widely available, the real, the push for this recording was to try and capture some of the birds that were in steep decline. And I'm hopeful that I'll be able to uh, play a, um, a recording here um, with, um, thankfully, some uh, video as well. Maybe we can get that later, but we've had a little bit of trouble early on, so we will make an effort to uh, to listen to the the keen notes of uh, Ivoryville woodpecker, which were recorded in 1935. So we'll, we'll try and get that for you after our uh, 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 break here in, the, in uh, about half an hour or so. Um, 
Binoculars uh, also have evolved over time. And we have, um, you know, in, binoculars were, were really um, being used in, um, in small numbers in the mid 1800s. Um, in the late 1800s, they, they were getting better. Um, Carl Zeiss, uh, his organization, he with uh, three, four, five business partners were really advancing what we understand today as um, you know, binocular. Um, Zeiss himself was not initially the expert in glass. He was an expert in sort of the, um, the form, the actual handling of the binocular, the, the frame around the glass. That was his area of expertise. He brought in partners who were, uh, you, you know, um, uh, very learned in the use of uh, glass and magnification and so on. Uh, but those binoculars uh, really didn't become popular until after World War I. And then they started to um, become more and more common. There was a period certainly during World War II where um, the German glass was not being uh, shipped out for obvious reasons. But then after World War II, there was sort of this explosion of binocular availability, good binoculars um, that really um, had better glass, better magnification, and then even a wide angle view, which is uh, um, a real key component of those. So these sturdier binoculars replace the opera glass, and we have this abundance now. I mean, it's just amazing for those of us that go shopping, uh, how many choices there are for binoculars today. And the quality of binoculars is just fantastic. So what are some of the current and popular birding tools, the technology that we're going to be talking about tonight? Well, one of the most common ones is um, so the, the use of social media, and uh, a start, good starting point of social media is Facebook. Um, so Facebook's been around for many, many years now, um, and probably most of us, if we don't use it, we're, we know about it, we understand it, um, allowing so much communication to go on and allow so much sharing of information so Facebook birding groups provide uh, a, a real online community of birders that in some ways is not so different than our birding clubs and organizations. We get to know people uh, through these Facebook birding groups and there are many different types of, of Facebook birding groups. But here are a few that, um, that I just thought I'd add that many of us might, might know locally, there's a group called Birding Ohio, which I think has, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's well over a thousand members. Ohio Chase Birds, uh, which is for uh, rarer species. Um, a national group, the American Birding Association's Rare Bird Alert. And so some of you may be aware of the um, ratings of relative uh, abundance and, and conversely rarity. So the, the rarest of birds, those coded four and five, I believe, are the birds that uh, are um, incited, added to the ABA's rare bird alert. And there are certainly tons of others, and we'll talk about a few of those in more detail in a little bit. Um, Twitter, so um, uh, Twitter's become a very common uh, tool uh, over the last few years. Um, and so these Twitter messages initially meant to be, I think, 140, limited to 140 characters, was, uh, has been a tool to share information very quickly, a short message about either a bird or perhaps a birding event. Um, and so there are um, the use of Twitter for sending out messages, um, short pieces of information, has been used by many, many birders. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those applications as well. Ebird, no conversation these days about birding technology would be complete without recognizing um, what um, eBird can, can do for us. Uh, uh, from being able to create our own lists, uh, an online tool to put our own list of birds in, to be able to look for uh, birds, using it as a tool to find birds, and to share information, documenting with our photographs, with our recordings, and to have that information then be beneficial for 
uh, ornithologists, scientists, to understand the movement of birds, the breeding of birds, um, when birds are threatened and, and truly endangered. Um, all of that, all of that can, can, can be done through the use of eBird as we collectively put our information about bird sightings into that tool. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, field guide apps, and you know, I, I, I just listed um, a handful of those field guide applications. So, you know, they, they are so similar to the books. It's an electronic version of those books, but an enhanced version. Uh, and because of uh, the fact that we're not limited by the number of pages necessarily, these apps often can include greater amounts of information. And they can include things that we just couldn't get out of a book itself. And the most meaningful in my perspective is the actual songs and calls of birds. To be able to be in the field and to be able to you know, look at those, those photographs, those drawings, to be able to identify the bird. Um, but then, after hearing the bird maybe in the field, to quietly listen to that song on our field guide say, yeah, that was the bird, or no, that wasn't the bird that I, that I heard. That, that has really, um, for me, enhanced my ability to identify birds. Um, there's a tool out there called Merlin, also from Cornell, that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, and this is sort of the next generation, if you will, or the current generation of bird identification. Um, Merlin has a couple of functionalities to help birders identify birds. The first one is a, um, a just a filtering process, a question and answer process uh, that allows you to kind of go through a, um, a, a process of elimination or a process of identification of certain attributes to the point where it can suggest what the bird you're seeing is or maybe it gives you a, a few choices. What's really exciting though is this ability to take a photograph of a bird, submit it into the Merlin tool, and then have Merlin from that photograph suggest what bird you're seeing. I've used the tool and um, while I've had mixed results, at times it is just astonishing that, uh, that it's able to really identify birds so well, but it's certainly far from perfect. And I will do this uh, at least once or twice more, but I caution all of you who might want to use an identification tool like this to be wary of um, the information and to really um, uh, avoid bypassing um, the other processes that would help identify a bird. I've seen so often on social media uh, folks um, put a picture on there and say, this is the bird because Merlin says so. And, you know, it wasn't the bird. Yeah. So, so be wary of, of that, that, you, that although it will suggest a bird, you probably want to confirm that, um, uh, if, especially if you're a newer birder uh, uh, or don't have familiarity with the species. Anyways, it's, a, it's an exciting technology, and it certainly sort of shows us what the potential for this uh, identification process is. And you know, we'll talk about the pros and cons of this, but I, I, I'm certain that to some of us, it's already occurring to us, well, is that really birding? Is that, you know, the part of the value of birding, for me at least, is learning the bird, is being able to identify it myself, not have someone else or something else tell me what that bird is. And so um, I see it as a tool that can help us, um, but I do see, as I pointed out in the earlier example, that it is a shortcut that, um, that for, for many of us probably is not worth it. So, but, but look at it as a supplemental tool and look at it as a tool to help learn, uh, but perhaps not the be all end all. And for me, uh, I get a lot of my joy being able to learn the bird and then identify it myself. And some of you may feel the same way. You know, we're talking about technologies today. Um, 
many of these technologies first showed up on the internet. Uh, we, we use them on our home computers, and um, but but over time, as we talked about earlier, and, you know, it looked like about 95% of you have your cell phone, your smartphone with you tonight. So we know the, that that they're all over the place. All these applications, these programs, then became available on mobile technology. So as we're talking tonight, we're really talking about both the tools that we have on, inter on the internet, but we're also talking about the fact that these um, tools are almost always now available on our mobile devices, whether it's a smartphone. I've seen people with their tablets in the field and using those. Um, so these mobile, the, the, these um, applications are really valuable on our mobile devices. Uh, so we know that there's been this huge movement to technology, and I, I, I think there's some benefit in just quickly asking, why is it? Why, have, why has technology just taken the birding world by storm? You know, kind of just flowed through it. And so here are, uh, I think, a few reasons why that's happened. So as I mentioned earlier, technology is everywhere. Um, it, it certainly, it's everywhere in our lives today. So why wouldn't it be part of one of our favorite hobbies? Um, and, and clearly mobile technology has just improved um, so greatly. Um, birding itself has increased in popularity. So if we have a more popular hobby, we have more people entering, it just stands to reason that those people come into this hobby with different perceptions on how they're gonna enjoy it. So many of them bring desire to use technology, and that means more people using technology uh, when they bird. Well, birding is clearly, can be a social activity, right? Some of us um, really only go birding with others. You know, many of us bird alone, uh, but birding is clearly, can be a social activity. And so, uh, these social media tools allow a greater level of sharing, expression, of connection uh, with one another. So um, I, I, I think it, it, it is uh, a very natural um, evolution of social media tools connecting with birders who do this um, to be a part of a birding community. And, and as I mentioned here, younger birders uh, really are amazing as far as their integration of technology with all the things they do. I recall um, uh, just a few years ago being out with a young birders group and um, seeing a hawk which I misidentified in the field as a broadwing hawk, as a young broadwing hawk. And I was questioned by a young female birder who said, no, I think that's a Cooper's hawk. It might be, I think it's a broadwing. Within probably 30 seconds, she had taken a photograph of her, sent it to a group of her friends to get feedback, and several of them had identified the field marks that were confirming the bird as a It was a, It was a humbling moment for me, but it was really interesting to see the application of the technology so quickly and so comfortably. Yeah, I, I ignore even sort of the social aspect of, you know, her kind of, you know, questioning that so directly. I, I was really impressed by the whole thing. Um, birding has this competitive aspect, no doubt about it. Not all of us do this, but there are, there is a competition. Uh, you may have just, you may have one friend who uh, you kind of, in a very light way, compete with. You may compete with yourself. I got, you know, 50 birds in the county last year. I want to get 55 in the county this year. But there are all these events um, that take place throughout the year. So no doubt, birding can have a competitive aspect to it. And this technology allows for an enhancement of that competition, if you will. Being able to find birds more quickly. If you're doing a big day, I don't know how folks could do a big day in this era without the, these tools, these technology tools, if you're really trying to maximize your list um, for the day. 
And um, maybe not so much as the first four, but this last uh, aspect is a, a, a bit of an interest to me. Um, there's a gaming aspect or a correlation, I guess it is, with birding. Um, and, and maybe that is very similar to the competitive aspect. But my, my daughters um, were into this uh, game, Pokemon Go. How many of you are familiar or even heard of Pokemon Go? Okay, so Pokemon was a, was a, uh, a very popular um, a cartoon um, um, manga or anime, anime um, back uh, 50, 20 years ago. Um, but about five, six years ago, maybe eight years ago, there was uh, something that, that was built um, through its expanse of the brand um, called Pokemon Go. And as I understood it, um, the, um, the, the, the tool would, um, through GPS capabilities, place these Pokemon characters out into um, the community, the physical community where players would then go to try and search out and collect and find these Pokemon characters. They couldn't see them, obviously, but through GPS, uh, sort of geocaching type of technology, they searched for, found, and collected these characters. And as I discussed this with my youngest daughter a week ago, it was just amazing the corollary with birding. And so I have, you know, I'm not surprised at um, the way that younger birders approach birding because I think it's very similar to this uh, to this game. So anyway, I thought I'd mention that as a perhaps just another uh, another factor in this evolution of technology and um, how it's connected to, to birding. Tim, you want to talk a little bit of technology here? I do. This is what I take into the field. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, uh, Tim was talking about uh, um, you know observation. It, when, I, when somebody is first learning to bird, especially you know that if we're at a birding hot spot, I usually tell them to don't take a field guide out, don't look at your phone, just enjoy the birds when you're there. Just watch them. You have plenty of time when you get home to look at those birds. Um, I use, I am a birder, but uh, I use most of my observations for conservation. <laughs> so when I say conservation, anybody want to tell me what comes to your mind? What's the word conservation mean to you? Any thoughts? Saving. Saving. Saving what? Resources. Resources. Okay. Um, so I use bird observations to save resources. Well, how, how can that be valuable? Um, uh, who anticipates the first red winged blackbird of the spring? Yeah. What date do they come back, Bill? End of February. End of February. <laughs> what date? If you were to guess, 23rd. And how could you verify that? My personal experience. Do you write them down? No, oh, but I have a camera that automatically takes <laughs> days. So, so every year, on that day, that bird comes back, right? Or some of that species. Around, yeah. And through that observation, um, we know that bird comes back. Now, what if everybody in this room watched for that red blackbird every spring? we have a better idea of what date that bird returned? Yes. yes. What about if everybody in the United States looked for that bird? Would we have a better idea? Yes. <laughs> and that's what we're doing, and that we're going to talk a little bit more about eBird, um, is that we are documenting species throughout the world uh, coming back, migrating, but also some very rare species as well. And some of these rare species then allow us to um, conserve because they're special birds. How many of you guys have heard of the cerulean warbler? Yeah, if you see a cerulean warbler, that's fantastic. If you document that cerulean warbler, it's even better. Because that warbler has a lot of funding associated with it. And you can use that funding to protect the land. So using technology um, really is, is so important to conservation. Everybody here can do that. Um, we use, you know, we're going to talk about eBird, but we use a, an app on, on these called Fulcrum. And it, you have to pay, it's a subscription. But it allows us to take 
um, an observation in the field, it records the GPS point of that bird as soon as we type it in. The GPS abilities in these iPads and your phones are better than any of those old um, GPS units that we used to carry around. So it's documenting a species at a point in time um, and georeficit that point. If everybody did that, then we can start putting it into, into maps. We can look at, and I hopefully we'll get these links to work a little bit later, we'll be able to track migration. We'll see where these birds gather um, in, in, in certain areas, certain habitats. Um, technology is letting us, allows us to watch these birds as they come across from Canada, but maybe go all the way like the black hole warbler to the Carolina coast before it flies out into the ocean. And that's just through observations. Um, how many of you guys have um, journals at home? How many of those journals have bird records in them? Or nature, yeah. Did, have you added them to um, eBird by chance? No. Good answer. <laughs> um, so even those are valuable because we can actually add those into eBird now, those single observations and they will actually uh, help us track these birds. It's, it's helping us track declines. It's also helping us track, track birds that are recovering. Mm -hmm. So these observations. So just using technology um, to, to help do that. I'm interested in how data from bird populations translates into preservation of habitat. So most of the time, yes. So the way we use the, the bird data, at least in Cleveland Metro Parks, and I'll talk globally in a little bit, but in Cleveland Metro Parks, there are some key birds, right? There's some key birds that are found in good quality habitat, either forested habitat, grassland habitat, wetland habitat. If you can doc document these birds in those communities, you're more likely to get funding for land acquisition and uh, protection. So tell me more about the funding. How does that happen? How does that happen? Um, there's certain funding sources. So we use Clean Ohio quite often. There's also some mitigation money. So for one example, I'll use, uh, so some of these come up very quickly. Um, there was, uh, everybody familiar with the pipeline going through Ohio, mm -hmm. right? When that pipeline goes through Ohio, uh, they are destroying habitat. And when they destroy habitat, they are required to mitigate that habitat. When the mitigation occurs, it has to be in areas where if it's for birds or for bats, that those high quality areas are, are there and they can be protected. We were allowed, we were able to get money in Cleveland Metro Parks to buy um, almost 100 acres in Rexville Reservation through bat mitigation money. And the only reason we were able to get that is somebody documented bat species throughout Cleveland Metro Parks. And we had those records available. And that's how we're allowed to get that funding. Um, we get funding through Clean Ohio, which allows us um, um, land acquisition as well. And they love the bird part of these applications. It's very important for um, uh, the application to have a strong bird component. The fun, the interesting thing is, is a lot of times, you know, these grants come up, you don't have time to go out to that property to bird, to document those birds. So we re rely on historical records, we rely on eBirds, we rely on um, our Audubon Spring Bird Walks, we rely on Christmas Bird Counts, to gather what would likely be in that area to be using that for conservation as well. Did, did that answer your question, Tom? Yes, sure. Okay. Um, so now I should look at my screen. You guys will realize that I don't have my glasses on. Um, so the collection of data. Uh, and then communication too. Um, today, just in fact, I, I got a, a, a text from uh, uh, an enthusiastic young birder named Jen, Jen Brumfield, right? Boom, boom, boom. And uh, she says, yeah, and another birder was out and documented, I'm not gonna give you a species because I don't want everybody to run out the door looking for this bird, but down in the national park. So it, you know, right away, we're allowed, to, we, we know when somebody has a special plant, animal, bird, um, so that, that communication, but then we can also communicate that up the, the chain. So in Cleveland Metro Parks, I'm gonna give you an example, down in um, uh, near Station Road Bridge, there's one wetland that has least bitterness that nests in there. That is a really special bird for a wetland. 
Um, so knowing that, communicating that is very important in this conservation. You can do it through electron electronics and, and uh, some of these apps as well. Uh, and it, you know, it, again, volunteer opportunities. Uh, I know s several of you have helped out in some bird uh, um, surveys with me. Uh, it's also, you know, technology is uh, it is very educational. It, uh, you know, Tim mentioned that you know, um, um, not being a real fan of you know an iPad or some of these um, uh, uh, um, these programs that are now identifying plants and animals for you. I see it in a different light because these youngsters get excited about. And yes, they may not be right, and some of these programs are not 100% accurate. They, they come out to be about 70% now, and they're getting in better and better. How do these programs get better? Does anybody have an idea of how that technology works? Yeah. What's yeah. that? More data. Yeah. More data. More data. And they are actually, Merlin is asking people to contribute photos for that, so that they use these photos to look at variation, the more photos in a library they have available, the better those programs become. And they start pushing that 90, and the goal is about 95% um, accuracy in those programs. So people like you can submit photos to Merlin to make these um, programs even better. Any, any questions about that? Uh, and then, um, <coughs> and, yeah, for me, uh, some of the most rewarding um, parts of my job is knowing that these records that I've submitted are leading directly to conservation, that it will protect you know, all plant samples as well as birds into the future. That's my personal connection. And I hope that anybody here that is using eBird now knows how important that is, and that's your connection also to conservation. If we can get these links to work a little bit later, it is amazing what um, people are doing with eBird now. They are tracking global climate change. They are tracking um, migration patterns. They're tracking rare in, um, bird species. They're tracking common species that are declining very rapidly. They're also using it for funding for protection of some of these rare species. They're, they're mining um, this information, looking for those rare species to protect them. And um, that is occurring right now. And that's just through observations from people like you and me. So with that, I think I'm going to see what's next on here. Should we, this would be a good place for a break, maybe? Yeah, let's take a short break. Do you say anyone wants to try that coffee? Are we all set of coffee? <laughs> so let's take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come right back and jump into the second half. <laughs> 